afternoon, everyone. I'd like to call the session to order and welcome you all to this afternoon's panel. Silent Spring at 55, Environmental Policies in a New Era. My name's Andreas Westgart, and I'm a second year master's in public policy student here at the Kennedy School of Government. I'm very excited to be introducing uh, this distinguished panel today. Before I get started, I'd just like to say a little bit about my own personal background. My mom lives in Cape Cod, about 75 miles away from here, and whenever I go back, it's a tradition of ours to go on a walk on the Cape Cod National Seashore. And uh, we do this every morning that I'm back. And uh, one thing that always stood out to me is that there's a plaque uh, next to the seashore that reads, um, you know, on this day in 1961, uh, President Kennedy dedicated 40,000 acres of land to be preserved. And that's just one small piece of Kennedy's legacy that affects me today. But um, it's one of the things that inspired me to come to the Kennedy School. And uh, I believe that his idealism and also his pragmatic approach to policy is one of the driving forces that made me committed to uh, public service and a career in public service. Um, I'd like to say that when I came here, I wasn't an, en an energy policy expert. Uh, in fact, I had a background in finance. But through the Kennedy School and its curriculum, I actually became an avid enthusiast of the environment. And also, I got the skills um, that allowed me to perform <coughs> the policy analyses of environmental policy. And I'm grateful for that. Ultimately, it culminated in my master's thesis, where I looked at energy efficiency policies. And this is an exercise where you work with a real life client. And it was very exciting because my client was O Power. I'm sure I'm filled with an audience that is probably familiar with O-Power. Um, and they use behavioral techniques to incentivize people to reduce mm -hmm. electricity consumption. And uh, what our study found was that using uh, energy efficiency policies in certain states led to a 10% reduction in energy usage among residential customers, which is, an, which is an exciting finding, and we presented that to them. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce our distinguished moderator, um, Professor <laughs> Professor Bill Clark. You disagree. Um, <laughs> Professor Bill Clark is the Harvey Brooks Professor of International Science, Public Policy, and Human Development at Harvard University's John F. Kennedy School of Government. He has a distinguished career. He's co-authored numerous books, including most recently a book entitled Pursuing Sustainability, A Guide to Science and Practice. Professor Clark is a member of the National Academy of Sciences and a MacArthur Prize winner. He earned his Bachelor of Science from Yale University and a PhD from the University of British Columbia. Please join me in welcoming Bill and the rest of our distinguished panel. Thank you, Andreas. Uh, welcome here all to our panel discussion. Uh, Andreas has given you a good uh, overview of, of what we're about. It's creating more people like him. Um, so uh, the, the plan of the day as follows. In a second, I will uh, introduce our panelists who actually you know, cover both a long range of history and a long range of engagements with uh, the environment and public health. Uh, what we'll do is an initial set of statements from them that are trying to put the uh, Kennedy legacy and its successors in context. Uh, we will then shift uh, rapidly to a notion of, yes, but it's now, now, and Kennedy isn't here, so what on earth should we be doing? Um, we'll do one round of that up here on the front and then open it up for uh, discussion. Uh, so, uh, let me, with, with no further ado, quickly uh, introduce my colleagues here. Uh, immediately to my left uh, is uh, Gina McCarthy. Uh, she is uh, currently a fellow at the Institute of Politics uh, here at the Kennedy School, she spent the spring semester with us, seriously livening us up. Um, uh, in, in her uh, career before reaching this pinnacle of Harvardness, um, <laughs> she's been a career public servant uh, spanning both Democratic and Republican administrations. Uh, most recently, uh, if you have not been asleep, uh, as uh, head of the EPA in the Obama administration. Um, she has a long tenure uh, preceding that, working on human health, environment, intersection issues at EPA in the states of Massachusetts and Connecticut. Uh, she, uh, unlike me, is seriously homegrown, you'll never tell, um, uh, with degrees from UMass and Tufts before she uh, came here. Um, uh, to, to her left, Roger Porter, uh, the IBM professor of business and government here at Kennedy School. Since 1977, but we've never been able to hold on to him. Uh, he has kept leaving for Washington, but then deciding we really weren't that bad and coming back. 
Um, he has had more than a decade cumulatively of uh, work as a, uh, in uh, very senior positions in the White House under Presidents Ford, Reagan, and uh, George Herbert Walker Bush. Uh, he is an expert on presidential decision making, as one would hope after that much training, um, and teaches it here, uh, a uh, expert on economic policy. Uh, also homegrown after a confusing time, he went to, Harvard, to Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar, degrees from Harvard, um, and many other things, but we're not going to tell about them. Um, to his left, Rob Stevens, Albert Pratt Professor of Business and Government at Kennedy School, where he also directs our PhD programs and a really exciting uh, joint uh, degree program with the business school. Um, Rob, uh, very early in his time here, directed a thing called Project 88, which was a sort of quintessentially Kennedy School uh, bipartisan effort sponsored by the then Senators Tim Wirth and John Heinz, uh, looking at what was then uh, news on the street of bringing innovative market approaches to deal uh, with problems of environment, business, and development. Um, since then, he served as the chair of EPA's Economic Advisory Board. Uh, he is sort of homegrown with degrees from Northwestern, Cornell, and Harvard, so it's okay, he gets to talk to. Having no degrees from Harvard, I don't get to talk after doing the introductions. <laughs> so with that, um, let me start the first pass where I've just asked us to do a sweep at starting back in the time of Silent Spring and President Kennedy and bringing us up to where we are today so that we can then turn to what do we do now with a bit of that historical context behind us. And I can think of no one better uh, than to situate us here in Massachusetts in what is uh, will eventually come out as a global movement than Gina McCarthy. Thank you, Gina. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Uh, Bill, when you say we represent a long range of history, is that just a, a fancy way of saying we're old? Yeah. Uh, that's what I thought. Okay. <laughs> that's why it's very important just, to get just the student to double introducing check. us. Yeah. <laughs> They're not dead yet. <laughs> it really is an honor to be on this panel with uh, such distinguished scholars, and you'll pretty much already know that I'm from Boston. Um, you'll also know if you soon enough if I don't tell you that I'm a practitioner, not a scholar. So you'll understand everything I say. <laughs> so uh, that's why it's been no, so nice to have her here this term. <laughs> uh, so let me just kick it off by saying that I just could never have imagined myself as a kid growing up uh, just south of Boston that I would ever get a chance to speak at Harvard uh, to talk about uh, President Kennedy. So my mother, I, I just hope she's watching this now. She never thought I would amount to anything. <laughs> so uh, President Kennedy once said, let us not be blind to our differences, but let us also direct attention to our common interests and to the means by which those differences can be resolved. And if we cannot end now our differences, at least we can help make the world safe for diversity. For in the final analysis, our most basic common link that we all inhabit this small planet. We all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's future and we are all mortal. This celebration is a really good time for us to remember the power of President Kennedy's vision for a brighter future and for all of us in this little planet that we each call home and to remind us about the strength of his leadership and his belief in the power uh, and resilience of the human spirit um, we need a lot of resilience at the moment. And the greatness of America, which he believed in, our science, our ingenuity, our innovation, our creativity, our focus and our determination. So he knew then, what is true today, that the world looks to America to lead. They look to us to actually say that every challenge that we're facing, we actually can resolve it and we can tackle it, that we are not afraid to face anything, like putting a man on the moon in his time, or tackling the most significant existential challenge of our time, which is climate change. You know, at a time when leadership is absent in Washington, D.C., we have to find a way to lead because the world continues to watch us. President Kennedy bet on American science and technical expertise. He bet on American workers and businesses when he went and saw us land on the moon and come back. And we have to do the same thing if we really hope to fight against the very real threats that climate change poses to our health and safety and the stability of this small planet, as well as continue to make progress on the challenges that Rachel Carson 
showed us, the challenges of clean air and clean water. Now, I think President Kennedy would have been extraordinarily proud of the climate actions we took during the prior administration. He understood what Pope Francis called a moral obligation to act on climate as stewards of God's natural resources. And President Kennedy actually had ocean in his blood. He once said, I really don't know why it is that all of us are so connected to the sea, except I think it's because in addition to the fact that the sea changes and the light changes and ships change, it's because we all come from the sea. And it is an interesting biological fact that all of us have in our veins the exact same percentage of salt in our blood that exists in the ocean. And therefore, we have salt in our blood, in our sweat, and in our tears. We are tied to the ocean. And when we go back to the sea, whether it is to sail or to watch it, we are going back from whence we came. So I am extraordinarily glad to be here with all of you who cherish President Kennedy's life and his connection to the natural world in which we live, and hopefully to remind ourselves that the United States is a democracy of, by, and for the people. So at times when the federal government loses sight of its way, it's up to all of us to remind them that clean air, water, and land are not just core values. They are the path that we must follow if we hope to protect our children's future. Thank you. Thank you, Gina. Roger, how did we get from that vision on the direction to where we are today? Uh, well, let me... Uh, I'm done. These are the hard questions are for these guys. <laughs> uh, let me echo what Gina has said with respect to what a privilege it is to be part of this celebration of President Kennedy's 100th birthday and to be on a panel with a group of people who are extraordinarily thoughtful and distinguished. I like these occasions for several reasons, one of which is that it's very easy for us to become mired in what I like to call the thick of thin things. <laughs> and we're worried about what is happening in the moment. And it pays for us to step back and take a little longer view. If you do that with respect to the environment, you look over the last 50 years. In fact, if you look at, at the last 50 years, whether it's communications, transportation, education, healthcare, agriculture, manufacturing productivity, we have made huge progress but probably in no area more than in the environment. I mean, it's quite remarkable what we as a society have done over this period of time. We've done it in an interesting way because when we began, we, we're, we're a big country geographically as well as population. If you look at large countries, China, India, the United States, Brazil, Canada, that have a lot of land, there's always a question, are we going to do this at the local or provincial or state level, or are we going to do this at the national or federal level? And we have this debate, we've had this debate in the United States for over 200 years. And the environment is a very interesting case in point because we decided in the early 1970s that doing it on a state by state basis was simply not sufficient. So President Nixon, through the Reorganization Act number three, of 1970, that's back in the days when presidents had a lot more power to reorganize government. He created the Environmental Protection Agency and established uh, Bill Ruckel's house as its first administrator. And then passed the Congress, both houses by bipartisan majorities in both House and Senate, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the uh, Toxic Substances Act, Gina has had the opportunity to work with all of these for a long period of time. Really quite a remarkable accomplishment. Um, the largest piece of environmental legislation, the Clean Air Act Amendments of 1990, were enacted by a vote of 89 to 11 in the Senate and 401 to 21 in a House with the overwhelming majority, over 89% of Republicans and Democrats in both houses voting in favor of it. So as a nation, 
we have done something, I think, quite remarkable over this period <clears throat> of time. We have said there is this part of our lives, which we call the environment, the air we breathe, the water we drink, uh, et cetera, and we are going to, to take measures that will enable those in the future to have the kind of life we have or possibly <coughs> even better. So my opening contribution to this panel is I think we ought to be grateful to the large number of people, including career <coughs> civil servants like Gina McCarthy, uh, who have helped us make an enormous amount of progress on the environment during this last half century. Thank you. Rob. So naturally, I'll start by joining my panelists in saying what a delight it is to be on a distinguished panel and to be in a distinguished group with all of you. Uh, I'm going to try to uh, complete the picture of the arc of history on uh, the federal role in environmental regulation by reminding us of what we've heard, first of all, that at the time of JFK, it was principally state level environmental regulation. It was only with the administration of Richard Nixon uh, in the 1970s that the, we then had the major environmental statutes being put in place. One of the reasons for that, to connect it with the title of this session, was indeed the rise of environmentalism, the advocacy groups. That could be attributed and linked directly to Rachel Carson's book. But there were other reasons as well. One of them was the Congress was afraid of a so-called uh, race to the bottom, that the states would compete economically and put in place less ambitious environmental policies than otherwise. Another was private industry, in particular the auto manufacturers then all located in Detroit, uh, who didn't want to produce more than one type of technology, and that's what they would face with state-level environmental regulation, so they preferred the federal uh, government. Uh, fast forward to an administration in which Roger worked and played a very important role, uh, the George H.W. Bush administration, <coughs> Bush 41, that was a point at which for the first time what are really transboundary environmental problems, interstate environmental problems, it was called acid rain, as you'll recall, were being uh, dealt with, and they dealt with it with a path-breaking approach, the SO2 Allowance Trading Program and the Clean Air Act Amendments in 1990. But that interstate nature of the problem gave an additional reason to use the federal government as the major force as opposed to relying on the states. Now I'm going to fast forward even more to the Obama administration, which of course was the first administration to deal to the degree it did with climate change, both internationally and domestically. And what's striking about climate change in this arc I'm trying to draw for you is that uh, greenhouse gases mix in the atmosphere. Glo uh, this is a global commons problem. It doesn't matter where it doesn't matter where they come from. That means that an individual country can't do it on its own. Whereas we could address acid rain on our own. We could address certainly localized problems. And therefore, international cooperation is absolutely essential. And in fact, it was, I'm very bipartisan, I should say. I've worked with Republican White Houses and Democratic and members of Congress on both sides of the aisle. But it's to the credit of uh, the former President Obama, together with the Chinese government and the head of state in China, that we have what is now this landmark agreement, the Paris Climate Agreement, because it was the two leaders, in addition to all the people in the government, so the two leaders leaders in a series of two an joint announcements that brought that about. So we have this arc going from you know, state level policy to the beginnings of national policy and then because of interstate problems, more national policy. And now with a global commons problem, we're going to international policy. And now I come to the Trump administration. Uh, and um, here's a situation where we may be moving back to the 1960s in the following sense, that if you were to take the administration at its word, it's not interested in reducing levels of environmental protection. What it is explicitly interested in doing, uh, certainly from Administrator Pruitt, is to reduce the role of the federal government and to de delegate more authority to the states. Whether or not they will succeed in doing that or even follow through on trying to do that, it's too soon to say. But I'll finish by saying that after almost 60 years after the time of JFK, um, it looks like the arc of history may actually take us full circle. 
Well, that's depressing. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Rob. This, this was supposed to be a trajectory. Well, we'll let that go. Um, I guess I, I, will, I will add to that uh, as, as your token natural scientist uh, on the panel, even though I'm supposed to just moderate. Uh, the one thread I, I would put in beneath <coughs> this is that uh, when, uh, when uh, Kennedy was in office, when, uh, when Rachel Carson was pushing her arguments about contamination uh, of our seas and skies and biota, um, it wasn't that environmental scientists weren't doing anything, but uh, I was being trained as one at the time. It's hard to think just what we were doing and how it connected to public policy. Um, when, when, when the first Clean Air Act uh, federal statutes came in, the actual numbers of safety levels were written in by lawyers because the scientists, my tribe, could not stop talking to each other about uncertainty levels. Since then, though we are still, uh, let us say, uh, unable to have just one hand. Uh, one of the interesting stories is that the science foundations of environmental policy have really uh, radically caught up. Uh, we've gone from a time when the science was being pulled, you know, yelling and screaming by the political actors and the activists into a time that it's caught up, begun to be on a really good day, uh, moderately useful in informing public policy, and even to the <laughs> level that it sometimes now finds itself out in front of where uh, activist leadership is going. So it's, it's a new partner that's brought in. I think it's, uh, it, it exists not just when the governments and universities, uh, many industries now have highly competent uh, environmental science and health staffs within them. And on a good day, that becomes a mutually positively reinforcing venture. Uh, so I think as we look forward, which I'm now gonna challenge the group to do, um, it is not just that we have had this buildup in scale, this buildup of engaging federal and then international uh, legislative and rulemaking authorities. We've actually brought a world climate of supportive uh, uh, and guiding science uh, into the equation as well in ways that, that Carson was a voice in the wilderness uh, back at the time that Kennedy was forming his environmental ideas. So with, with that arc, let me take us up to not just the present, and we could obviously talk about affairs in Washington uh, for as long as they would let us, uh, but looking ahead at the next sweep of 55 years, um, looking out towards the end of this decade when, when if not uh, us, uh, our children and grandchildren uh, will be major players in the game. What are the major challenges that they are going to be facing in the environment, public health, growing economy space? And what are the things we ought to be doing now in order to preserve for them the opportunities to be able to shape their own worlds, healths, and good lives uh, that if we don't attend to some measures today, uh, we will be giving them an impoverished world rather than as Roger uh, and the others have pointed out uh, a world that for us uh, has improved hugely over the last 50 years. So what are the challenges? What should we be doing about it? Let me start with Gina and then we'll, we won't actually go down the panel. We'll just start a conversation up here. I, I, um, it, it's a, a big question, Bill. I, I'm, I'm having trouble thinking 55 years from now uh, versus like now. Uh, but let me just raise a couple of other points because um, I think Rob mentioned a couple of things that I want to bounce off of first. And that is that there's something very different about the challenges we're facing now. And this may be too simplistic a way to talk about it, but we had a lot of opportunity for reductions because we weren't really talking so much about the problem. It was very visible what the problem was. Right now we're, with an issue like climate, we're talking about an issue of prevention instead of treatment. And there's nothing worse than trying to get people to pay attention to an issue that's not visible to them. And it has put the scientists front and center of the discussion, both the science and scientists. And so it's, it's been a lot of the discussion back and forth has been whether science is right or science is wrong and, and now attacking the scientists for saying something. And so it's, it's a very different world than we were in before, and it raises a lot of dynamics that we didn't have to face before. But to me, the whole challenge of, of, uh, of where I see uh, the U.S. challenge in internationally, to me, I, I start landing on water more than anything else. I think we have large amounts of population. 
We have a challenge about protecting the cleanliness of the water we have, about moving forward with new technology to make that clean water available to people. And I think you see it as an underlying thread that is there for much of the insurgents we see around the world. And I think in the U.S. in particular, we're fully unprepared to deal with this challenge. We have huge backlog in terms of investment necessary just to maintain the infrastructure we have today that's 60 years old. I need a facelift. They've got to need a facelift. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And so we, this is, this is I, I just don't think we're realizing that the investments we made a long time are just not keeping up. And in the world of water, unlike air, we have very few technology advances. Frankly, the law doesn't push it. Mm -hmm. or the way we've implemented the law doesn't push it. So we have real challenges moving forward about living within the means that the earth has provided to us. Comments? So um, I'll mention what I think are two very great challenges, um, one in the domestic uh, realm and one in the international realm. Uh, in, the, in the domestic realm, I think the greatest challenge for environmental policy, for climate change policy, for all of it, is something that transcends, that goes way beyond environment and energy policy, and that's political polarization. Yeah. Now, it's played out in the environmental sphere back when the Clean Air Act amendments in 1990 were passed that Roger worked you know, brilliantly on. Uh, the vote in the House of Representatives was 93% of Democrats and 87% of Republicans. So that was an era in which uh, environment and energy were not partisan issues. They were regional issues, the voting. They were, they were not partisan. Now climate change has obviously evolved into being something even worse than partisan or more difficult than partisan. It's become an ideological issue. Yeah. And I think something like the way abortion is. And more information and knowledge about the process of human reproduction and gestation is not going to move anyone in this room from one side of the abortion issue to the other. You're on the side you are for other reasons than scientific information. That would be terrible for that to happen with yeah. climate change, which is fundamentally a scientific, economic, and therefore political challenge. So I think political polarization is at the heart of the problem. It's simply played out within climate change change and environment. On the international domain, I think there's an immediate challenge, but it's very important for the long-term bill, and it's timely, and that is that we now have an international agreement, the Paris Climate Agreement, which is absolutely path-breaking. We've gone from 14 percent of global emissions associated with signing countries, which was the Kyoto Protocol second commitment period, to 97 percent of global emissions covered. And it is the answer to the prayers of the United States because it involves the large emerging economies. That's what the Senate asked for in the Bird hagel resolution when they said they wouldn't ever ratify Kyoto back in 1997. And, it, and it's now been given to us. It is crucial the United <coughs> States remain a party. And as you may know, if you follow this, there was to be, there was scheduled to be a meeting in the White House yesterday with the principals and their deputies to discuss this. That meeting was postponed, but there are conflicting sources. I, I would never have thought I would have said seven months ago that the former uh, CEO of ExxonMobil would be the most important person in the administration working on behalf of sound policy in this realm and others for that matter. Uh, but it's true. But on the other side are some very powerful forces. So I won't go through all the arguments of why I think it's so important that we stay in Paris, because it enables me instead to refer you to something. Like a typical professor, I've written something, but it's going to be in the Boston Globe tomorrow morning, or it's online, Doug Veld tells me right now. So uh, Ban Ki-moon, the former Secretary General of the United Nations, who is a visiting fellow here at the Kennedy School, he and I have written an op-ed. It's online, it'll be there tomorrow. They didn't tell us what the title of it is, but it is essentially a set of arguments of why the United States must stay in the Paris Climate Agreement. But Rob has, of course, violated <coughs> professorial protocol 101, which is, well, you still want your students paying attention to you, don't tell them that something exciting is on the web. <laughs> Come on, Rob, <laughs> you know? <laughs> that was gonna be your last line. Was it? <laughs> but yeah, you was. Um, uh, it, Roger, save us. Well, uh, <laughs> tell them something really boring so they'll forget about <laughs> Rob's thing. And. Um, I think one of the most fascinating features of the United States as a country 
is how we bring together in a very interesting way business, government, and academia to solve and address problems. Mm -hmm. If you look at the way in which we conduct research and development in the United States, and I, I don't know the most recent figures. When I was there last, the United States was doing half of the environmental research done in the world. I mean, we, we love and we're very good at doing research and development. If you look at the way in which we do it, we made a very different decision. We made it at the end of the Second World War that we were not simply going to have government labs. We've got about 900 of those now. Mm -hmm. But we were also going to have a lot of our R&D, about three quarters of it is done by the private sector, by industry, and by academia. And if we're going to deal with clean water in the way that we've dealt with clean air, we need to have some technological solutions. Now, how do we get it through clean air? We got it basically through government mandates saying you've got to reach the corporate average fuel economy standards. And there was a huge debate at the time, I remember it well, between industry saying, you're, you're, you're setting a standard that we can't achieve. And if we can't achieve it, are you actually <coughs> going to shut us down? And people in the government saying, we actually believe that it's reasonable that you're going to be able to achieve this. And in fact, we have. And we're still doing it on the air. We have now, the, the average uh, um, uh, internal combustion engine vehicle, cars, trucks, buses, et cetera, pollutes less than 2% of what it did in 1970. And on the drawing boards, uh, we have got companies who one person has assured me that he believes within the next 10 years, we will be able to cut current emissions to one-tenth of what they are. Now, the problem that Gina quite appropriately draws our attention to is we've had a lot of success in air pollution with respect to using technological change and we desperately need a similar effort with respect to water and we've got to figure out how we can take these three elements of our society which are really quite remarkable I wouldn't trade our universities for the universities in any other country in the world I wouldn't trade our industry R&D for any other country in the world. I wouldn't trade our government for any other country <coughs> in the world. We've got a big, complicated, large society, and we constantly are struggling about what's the federal government going to do, what's uh, state and local governments going to do, and it's never perfect, and we go back and forth. But for the most part, it's been a history in which when people become convinced that there is in fact a problem. They're willing to bring all these resources together to do it. Rob talks about climate change, and that's a big problem. Our attitudes as a country about climate change today are very different than they were 25, 30 years ago. There's not consensus to mm -hmm. be sure, but there was a lot, there's a lot more consensus now than there was then that there is a problem. Now, what's the problem today is we've got much less consensus about what to do about it and what role the United States is going to play globally and internationally. But I see over the next, in response to Bill's question, over the next uh, several decades that uh, I would bet we will make progress. And I'm even more convinced not only that we're going to keep the trajectory moving in the right direction, but that the solution to it is going to come from a combination of governments, businesses, and uh, academia, and uh, independent research and development establishments helping us to, to figure out what's going to be the most efficient way to accomplish the goals that we want. Okay, so let me push back a little. You guys are in far too violent agreement with one another. Um, um, if, as I think m many of us would agree, uh, polarization, uh, which you know, is not something new, but uh, it is uh, something that has reached a stage of acuteness now that makes it really, really troubling, I think, 
Grob is very right. At times in our history, environment and public health have proven of uh, an issue domain, a, a, a set of, of shared concerns around which we've been able to bridge uh, otherwise polar divides, certainly across party lines, as we've been seeing, uh, certainly across <coughs> uh, business, government, uh, academic, uh, citizen action group lines, maybe less often across regional divides. But environment, public health has served that role in the past. Right now, as Rob points out, we feel a little bit more like at least some dimensions of environment, the climate ones, are, uh, are, are not that vehicle. That is, people are ideologically dug in. But can, can you guys talk a little bit about whether uh, if we go from environment is everything down into particular issue areas, like water, like infrastructure projects, and so on, you see prospects for building new coalitions for getting things done, whether at local level or state level or global level, um, around environment that can bridge some of these divides, can say, well, we can disagree <coughs> on some things, but we've got these things in common. Thoughts? Well, I think that this is going to sound very cynical, but um, if you put the, uh, the government and the Congress in a position of giving out benefits rather than giving out costs, then you can bridge all kinds of divides. So a, an example of that is that there was this breathtaking uh, departure from what's become the norm there, when a budget was passed in December 2015 and included in it was an extension of the wind and solar tax credits, which although from an economist's perspective have lots of problems, nevertheless in terms of actually accomplishing something, they're, ex they're very, very important. And that's because it, they're subsidies and everybody can agree on giving out subsidies. It's when you're giving out costs through a policy, that's when it becomes difficult. So what that does suggest is that there needs to be something that's given back at a minimum. And, you know, there have been various approaches with this. There have been attempts, and one of them recently was uh, two former Republican CEA <coughs> chairs with two former Republican uh, secretaries of Treasury who went down to Washington and made a presentation uh, to the head of the National Economic Council and other staff recommending a revenue neutral carbon tax in which the money uh, would be used essentially to send everyone a check to make it into a political winner. There are reasons why, from an economic perspective, that's actually quite problematic. But nevertheless, politically, it makes a lot of sense. And that could be an example of the sort of thing, because you're creating beneficiaries directly, that could bridge political divides. So Gina, Rob wants to pay them to get together. Uh, what about your vision thing from your introductory remarks? Is this areas where political leaders, local, state, and whatever, have some yeah. Wiggle room? I think the only thing that, uh, that's, that's a really hard question because, you know, I came from an atmosphere in D.C. where these things you just could not talk about them. You know, I talked to many Western governors and they were buying renewables like crazy because they're cheap. But they couldn't talk about it and they can't talk about climate change. You know, Branstad's not going to raise his, raise the flag about how Iowa the, buys the highest percentage of renewables anywhere in the country. Right because he's Republican, you know, it's just, so even though something is fiscally the absolute best thing to do and it happens to be driving in the direction you want, you can't even still talk about it, so it's hard. I leave, right now I think my faith is in cities. My faith is in mayors, you know, I think they are where a lot of the action is going to be and a, the reason being is they can't run away from anything. You find them in supermarkets. If you can find them in supermarkets, they can't, all, they can't deny the problems, and they can't run away from it. And I, I was kind of hoping that, you know, at least this administration would move forward on adaptation issues because we have to start thinking of climate as a normalcy. It has changed. People admit it's changed. But they just don't want to actually develop a plan for us to have a leadership role in that. So I, I would, I think there's a lot of possibility and potential for local leadership. And frankly, if, if uh, this administration does what it wants and devolves things to the state level, good luck to the governors trying to deal with, you know, the next cyanotoxin that goes into a water supply and shuts the city down. Go for it. 
You know, you've just taken away your ability to actually have the technical competence that only the federal government has that drives the answers as well as identifies problems. Do I sound bitter? No, 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 no. <laughs> and Roger never sounds bitter, so he's going to tell I us. I know, he's so reasonable. Um, Isn't it annoying? It is. It is really, really yeah, reasonable. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, let me, let me, let me shed a little, <laughs> little different perspective than you may uh, hear about or read about, uh, but I think is worth considering. Let's take the last year, last year of the Obama administration. Most people say, well, you're a lame duck administration, nothing is going to happen, we're holding an election, everything has to be put on hold. You got a Republican Congress, majorities in both House and Senate, Democratic president, there's the recipe for gridlock. Well, we passed on a bipartisan basis, uh, making permanent the research and experimentation tax credit. We had been trying to do that as a country, some of us, for 25 years. We passed the so-called doc fix for Medicare, which was the huge problem that doctors have when they, when they can't get reimbursed on their Medicare patients, and so they say, we're not going to treat them, et cetera. We've been grappling with that for over 20 years, and it passed both houses of Congress and uh, was signed by the President. We passed a $305 billion infrastructure transportation bill that passed both houses of Congress and was signed by the President. We passed trade promotion authority um, for, uh, um, that unfortunately, then we had a presidential election in which both candidates ran away from what uh, many of us thought was a very skillfully negotiated uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement which had been done on a bipartisan basis. Uh, passed the Africa Free Trade um, uh, Agreement. Uh, the list goes on. There was a lot of stuff that didn't make it much into the papers. You didn't read much about it. <coughs> but the people who were there were working away on problems, not as successfully as many of them would like, would have liked, but they were working away on them nonetheless, and that was the reason why 98% of Democrats and Republicans who ran for re-election in the Congress got re-elected, which is the norm that we've had uh, over the last several years. With all this dissatisfaction when people actually go to the polls and they figure out what it is they want to do, they do that. now. Let me make one other observation with respect to the current administration. I've had the opportunity to be there at the beginning in the White House three times. It is always chaotic. Uh, you've got a group of people coming in who are just getting started. In this administration, you've got far more people who have never been in government federal, state, or local, Secretary of State, Secretary of the Treasury, uh, Secretary of Commerce, National Security, uh, uh, National Economic Council, et cetera. They don't know one another well yet. You've got a president who's never been in government, federal, state, or local, wants to be a success, but has ended up spending the last year involved in a campaign that was probably the most content-free campaign we've had in our lifetime. Are you trying to make us feel better? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what happens once you get in there? The first six months are chaotic. You gotta figure out who can get things done and who can get things done well. I can assure you on the Paris Accord, there are sharp differences of opinion within the current administration on that. It's not just Rex Tillerson. It's <coughs> I know. I know. Okay, okay. And as a result, we don't know yet what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. My suspicion is that over time, we are going to see an arc of policy across a whole variety of areas, as has been the case in virtually every previous administration. Go back and look at the first two years of any administration in the last 50 years, and you discover this phenomenon, which shouldn't surprise us very much, 
because people are learning their jobs and they're learning how to work with one another and they're discovering as people who haven't been there, you, you came in as EPA administrator, but you know EPA well because you had been there. If you're an administrator coming in, you finally, you, you suddenly discover what? My gosh, I'm surrounded by a whole bunch of people who know a lot and who want to help me and our agency succeed. I've never met Scott Pruitt. I don't have any idea what kind of EPA administrator he's going to be like. I think I can predict with some confidence that, that a year from now, he's going to view many things quite differently than he does now because of the exposure that he has to one, one of the great privileges of working in government is the opportunity to see the high quality of work that is done all across the executive branch. And um, some people take longer to recognize it than others, but I have some confidence that this uh, chaos is not quite the word that I want because it's not it's, chaos <laughs> is not an adequate description. But, but, but we're not going to get an adequate description, uh, Roger. But, but, Wrap it up. But uh, this anxiety that we have about what is going to be the direction of policy um, is is going to take time to settle in, and I think we need to pause, take a deep breath, and um, and make sure that the points of view that we have are getting adequately expressed. Now, you might think that if I opened it up now for discussion across the panel, uh, things would get really interesting, but we're not going to do it. Oh. <laughs> we're going to reserve the I right really of rebuttal. Oh, yeah. you, guys, you guys do each get a summary comment at the end, so you can sharpen your whatevers for that. Um, uh, Roger, I can't. I, can't completely, uh, before I turn to questions from the floor, uh, say, yes, all the things you say is true. But it used to be in the old days that when, when the new blood came in, it said, first, we'll kill all the lawyers. This time, it seems to have come in and said, first, we'll kill all the civil servants and then all the scientists. <laughs> that causes some of us pause. So we shall see. We hope there will be enough around when people start loving them again. Um, OK, so we open it up now for the uh, remainder of this session to questions from the floor. Um, at the Kennedy School, we have the so-called Allison Rules, which is questions are very short. Uh, there's only one of them, and they end with a question mark. And um, uh, I think I am uh, put in as moderator here because the one thing I've learned is to enforce them, however embarrassing for all concerned. So uh, please identify who you are, ask a short question, and uh, we will try to move things with short questions, short answers, and get a lot of people up. So uh, yeah, keep your hands up. Or if you're on that side of the room, go to the mic. If you're on this side, raise your hand, and somebody will come around. Uh, and I leave it to you to do the picking. Here. Uh, good afternoon, Andy Wolf uh, from Connecticut. Professor Porter, I wish I could agree with you that uh, we take a deep breath, but I think they are just no. only beginning. And President Faust made a comment today that uh, is my takeaway. And she said, we're living in a post-fact reality. So the fa I almost drove off the road during the Flint incident understand what went on with Governor Snyder, but public health is a hot button issue for everyone, especially at the municipal city level. A question. The question is, what is your view on public health putting aside what we know about polarization in terms of swaying this uh, intransigent Congress? You could be just for public health. <laughs> well. Is it a leverage point? Can we do something with it? Everybody's in favor of better public health. And the way in which we deliver public health in the United States is the way in which we do most things. We decentralize it enormously. And a large part of it is done. Let's take the last you know, 50 years population has grown 135, no, no, excuse me, 67 percent. Employment in the private sector has grown by 135 percent. That's women coming into the labor force. Employment in state and local government has grown by 127 percent. And employment in the federal government has grown by 10 percent over that last 50-year period. 
We now got 22 million people employed by state and local governments, about 4 million people employed by the federal government. Rightly or wrongly, an enormous amount of what we do in this country is done at the state and local level. Um, we use the federal government to do a lot of <coughs> pain for this. An enormous number of programs, but uh, if you look at the way in which we deal with the environment, the Federal Environmental Protection Agency <coughs> has a big role, but they do a lot of it working with their counterparts in the states. EPA gets accused, often, unfairly, I think in my view, of trying to impose a one-size-fits-all solution on the country. In fact, at least in my experience when I was there, that was not the case. EPA was very sensitive to state implementation plans, et cetera. I'm going so to strive for, for equal opportunity, having both the panel and the audience hate me. So okay. is uh, public health a lever? Absolutely. And okay. if you look at what's happened to public health over the last 50 years in the United States, it's improved. And if we're going to continue to have improvements in it, we're going to need to be doing them at the federal, state, and local level. Okay. Next. Oh, yes. Why? Wait. One sec. One sec. Yeah, Very I, quick. I, I think public health is absolutely essential, but I do not see a commitment to public health in this current administration. Unless you support science, unless you stop attacking the science that tells us what is a public health problem and isn't, we are not going to make progress. And you can't say, I'm not going to worry about climate, I'm just going to focus on air and water. What do they think we're worried about climate change for? because it's going to dance in the woods somewhere? I mean, come on. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, short question, short answers. Lionel Spiro, Boston. Uh, would you comment on the role of Citizens United in all of this? Who'd like that one? <laughs> well, uh, I carry in my pocket um, uh, a sort of reminder of, I think, that because I have a little news story about the Koch brothers actually announcing the fact that they are going to be spending multi-hundreds of millions of dollars going into African-American communities to give gifts and to talk about how solar is an elitist issue and if they act on climate, it's going to take away jobs from their families. That to me is citizen side, uh, that Citizens United. And I simply throw back in, yeah, I agree. I have almost the same card. Um, but I have gone back and read the, uh, the history and the little bit of it I can remember from the time of the battles that Rachel Carson faced. This was not just uh, sort of general diffuse opposition. This was mounted, seriously funded campaigns to discredit the person and discredit the science. So heaven knows Citizens United did not make this any easier. Uh, but I think, um, though we've had some good happy talk, me too, about the potential for pairing up of the business sector, civil society, and government, uh, it was a problem then when uh, private actors' oxes were being gored, and boy, it's a problem now. And we've got less help from the courts right now than we had then. Rob? I'm going to comment partly in the spirit that I think Bill wants of some disagreement up here. Um, and, and that is, uh, it's not to take on particularly the, the you know, Citizens United decision, but rather lots of times I hear people say that the problem in the United States with regards to not being able to get more progressive environmental policy, particularly in climate change, is that it's the fault of private industry, and they talk about the oil companies, they talk about this company and that, and I think that's completely fallacious. I think it's just completely wrong empirically on the evidence. So uh, just, you know, for an example, you know, electricity companies, there are some very, very large electricity companies, not just PG&E, PG &E, but some other ones that are very, very supportive, for example, of staying in Paris and of climate policy. It's true of the oil companies. The three largest oil companies in the world, including the two in, in the U.S., Chevron has been neutral on it, but the others are, both Shell America and ExxonMobil. Uh, in mining, Rio Tinto, even in coal mining, two of the largest coal companies in the U.S. have been arguing to the President to stay in the Paris Agreement. There are coal companies and coal executives who have been very, very vocal and are very close to the president and, and have been big supporters, and that seems to be the people that have his ear. But the problem is not, in my mind, is not private industry per se. The problem is 
uh, this ideological infestation that's affected the electoral process and the nature of the people that are in elected office today. Can, can I respond to that? Is it okay, Bill? Yeah. You're the boss. Um, <laughs> you know, I, 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 it may surprise you, but I don't disagree with anything that you just said. No, I didn't think you would. No, uh, I, I, I don't disagree <laughs> at all. I guess the problem that I have is that I, I'm sort of with you is that this has become a religious exercise. Mm -hmm. You know, the utilities, when I talk to them individually, they have no problem with the clean power plant. Right. So that's exactly the signal they're looking for. Yeah. Right. I did right. it this way, yeah. not me, but everybody did, just to make sure that we weren't pushing it in a direction in which it wasn't heading. But they can't stand up and say it. Yeah. That's the problem right. that we're facing. Yes. But the dynamic on the Koch brothers is not about them as being oil companies. It's, it's the fact yeah. that, that we have an alignment here of people who don't want a federal government with people who are denying climate science in, in, in under some religious exercise. And it's a terrible mix of challenge that we're facing. But I didn't, certainly didn't mean it to imply that, that I don't like Rex Tillerson. I don't even know the guy. But I certainly know he's fighting for Paris, so I'm all for him. Here. Tony Constantouris from California. How do we connect with the 30% of the population that feels they are not being part of the government, business, and academia? Be good if he had an answer. Um, okay, so uh, when I'm actually working instead of being a moderator, um, I think a, a great deal of the answer we've heard already. It is it is engaging back at local, state, urban scale um, around leaders who want to solve problems because if they don't, um, people are going to hold them accountable for it. Uh, so I, I think you can do a, a great deal of work when the uh, leadership and vision uh, that Gina talked about at the beginning uh, is, is there on the table to work these issues. Um, but it's tying it to things that are of urgent concern to particular people in particular places mm -hmm. because, because their water is poisoned, because their backyard is flooding, because uh, their uh, Ogallala aquifer is being depleted. Uh, it's not to come out with campaigns that are pro-environment or anti-industry. It is figuring what's your biggest problem and what kind of an assemblage of actors from <coughs> I don't care where uh, can visionary leaders bring together and then the rest of us play support roles uh, to help move it on. And I've seen that work. Can I give a very specific example yeah. of what you're talking about that's within the realm of climate change? And that is, you're, I think you're completely right about that, these 30% of the population who tend to be in rural areas and, and lower education and male, um, that that group uh, feels that it's not their problem. But coal-fired power plants do not just emit carbon dioxide. They emit mercury. They emit par uh, particles, small particles, particulates, sulfur dioxide, and a host of other pollutants. And the damages of those pollutants take place not globally, they're not being transmitted to some other continent, they're in the location of the plants. And those plants are not in leafy green suburbs like I live in. Those plants are in rural areas and in relatively poor areas. And the areas around those power plants, therefore, that are burning coal have hor much worse air quality. And to recognize quantitatively how serious it is, so in the clean power plan, that you know was put forward by this by the previous administration in the clean power plan when they did their analysis this official regulatory impact analysis 94 percent of the benefits the economic benefits that they estimated domestically were due to the the reduction of correlated pollutants in particular small particles not climate change per se but that hasn't gotten out there and that would be the sort i would think that maybe Precisely. if environmental advocacy groups focused on that a bit more instead of only being in Washington, but got out into those other areas talking about those impacts, maybe that would be helpful. Yep. I no, you may not. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to, but I've got a queue that is much longer than 4.30. Yep. Thank you. Um, Lori Ehrlich, I'm a state representative in Massachusetts. And first I want to thank Gina for your work. It meant a lot to us mm -hmm. here in Massachusetts that you were um, Russo, You too. 
<laughs> she was an awful advocate awful. Yeah. in a wonderful way. <laughs> and, and I think, um, you know, symbolically, I think it's worth pointing out there's three of us in the room here that were um, represented three different components mm. Mm. of the state regulations for pollutants on coal yeah. burning power plants. Yeah. Um, Tom, Tom Powers, industry, Gina government, and I was um, before I ran for office, um, grassroots. So um, I just want to, you mentioned um, turning to cities as a place of hope. Don't give up on state legislatures. Okay. Because, you know, obviously this is Massachusetts. We're very blue. Um, there's a lot of noise right now, and it's hard to get, what, what I'm finding is it's hard to get people to prioritize the environment with so much else going on, and, and, and a lot of noise coming from D.C., but we are getting things done, and there are a lot, we do have a majority that, that care, um, so don't, don't give up on us. Um, but I also want to, um, Professor Stevens offered, you know, I, I agree with you that things are so polarized right now. There's another component to that that I think is worth pointing out, and it's sort of this anti-government um, Tea Party um, mm -hmm. mentality that I ran against when I ran for office. And people don't feel connected to DC in a way that they should. Um, just on the state level, 30% of This I'm, will yeah, turn to a question. I promise. Okay. Soon. Sorry. Elected people. You know, yeah. <laughs> That's why they pay me the big bucks. Yeah. Right? A microphone. Um, yeah. Right. So, you know, 30% of the DEP budget in Massachusetts comes from the federal government. So there, there's direct connection. So when things are cut, it affects us here, it affects real people. So how do we turn that around for people and make government valuable to them in a way that um, they, they don't go to the polls with this anti-government mentality? Yeah. Thank you. Great, great question. <laughs> Short answer. I don't know. <laughs> That's your <answer. laughs> I think that's what I was talking about when I was talking about libertarians and things. I think there's been a concerted effort to discredit anybody who works in the federal gov in the government as a whole. And we've lost a ton of state legislatures and, and a lot of them are really being held up to do things that the, that governors want because of Tea Party. Uh, uh, folks that have been elected. It's a, it's a real challenge. I don't want to write off state government um, because I certainly wouldn't. I, I think that's where you go for change when you need it. Um, but I, I think it's going to be very challenging because what we're seeing is exactly the opposite. We're seeing at the same time as this, this the government in D.C. is looking to roll back and reconsider everything, you've got you know legislatures trying to put additional barriers up that would prevent you from having renewables and electric vehicles and other things, and it's it's very challenging. Yep. Hi, I'm Dan Borges. Thanks for hosting this. I, I grew up down the street from Rachel Carlson's place, so it means a lot. Um, I spent 32 years in the federal government, retired as the chief of business practices <coughs> at the Army Corps of Engineers. I spent the last four years uh, as the senior policy advisor for water at the Nature Conservancy. I spent a lot of time up on Capitol Hill talking to to uh, staff who told me the same thing is that they'd, they'd love to agree with what we wanted to do for environmental protection, but and I wouldn't call it religious or ideological, but I, I think the money was there that prevented them from doing that in their caucus. So my question is, and it gets back to what uh, Ms. McCarthy said, is what can we do to empower cities? At, and, and is there something in place at this point? Uh, real quick point, I was at, at an EU follow-up meeting to the Paris Accord. <laughs> The mayor of Atlanta was there, the mayor of Miami was there. Two polar extremes on climate change, flooding and lack of water. They both recognize it, but I don't know what mechanism is in place, or is there one? Anybody know? So I'll comment, but I think what Gina said before is absolutely correct, and if we're talking about adaptation to climate change, which, because climate change is gonna take place, you know, if we cut CO2 emissions to zero tomorrow morning, uh, because of the stock in the atmosphere. So that adaptation for climate change is rightly thought of as, in most cases, a local uh, jurisdictional item. That's going to be the way it's be done most effectively. And lots is now happening in New York, Boston, other parts of the country. And But what's going to take is some cooperation and learning from one another. That said, I think if we're looking at the other side of mitigation, then I guess I'm less optimistic about the role of cities. And there, I think, it's going to be countries 
through international cooperation, but for possibly for the next four years in this country, it's going to be the states. It's going to be California, Oregon, Washington, New England, uh, the middle Atlantic states, and the upper Midwest. And if you think about those states from e recent elections, you know the color of those states. That's who it's going to be. That's where it is. And a lot is happening. I mean, the day after the election, Governor Brown made it clear in California that the 2030 target for the state was not going to be rolling back. It was going to be more ambitious than it would have been had it not been for the election <coughs> results. Last question here, then we will go into wrap-ups. Can I answer that in a way that doesn't sound quite as depressing as I feel like we all are at this point? You know, I actually am very hopeful in, in a couple of things, and, and forgive me for the first one. I just don't think this administration is, is going to have, be able to do the hard work it takes to roll everything back in the time that they have. I just cannot see it, only because I work like a dog for eight years to get there. And if they can figure it out, I'd be just amazed. Seriously. Okay, Se so secondly, you know, the, you. the clean energy is going to continue on the track it's on, whether you have a clean power plant or not you know, because it is the fiscally responsible choice, and so people can do it without having to claim a climate cred. And that's okay, that keeps progress going. I think individuals can actually do a lot, and I think it's extraordinarily meaningful right now. Because I know that there's a lot of businesses that want to, you know, basically show their, how, how um, thoughtful they are about their own footprint and what they're contributing. And I know with social media, that if somebody's watching that, things change and, and people can speak. To me, having transparent science and data is what's going to change everything. That's what concerns me about a lack of that because I think, I'm just really convinced having been at Harvard and how well everyone's getting taught that this generation is going to demand more as individuals than we've ever demanded before, and I think that's what's going to change it. Social media is actually a, a good opportunity as long as the data is right, you know. Um, two years before John Kennedy was elected president, a professor at Yale by the name of Charles Lindbroom wrote a very famous article entitled The Science of Muddling Through. And it was an argument that the American political system is essentially characterized by what uh, I like to call pervasive incrementalism. And we are constantly tinkering and going around. If you look at the regulatory processes that we've put in place, they slow things down, they force us to look at it several times, et cetera. I agree that they're not gonna be able to roll back a whole bunch of stuff simply because the provisions of the Administrative Procedures Act and others have been put in place to get us to look very carefully and clearly before we go make a move. Now, that's extraordinarily frustrating to people who want action right now. I love it. But it's a very wise approach, in my view, mm -hmm. to the way in which we want to frame public policies, because I would much rather measure twice and cut once yeah than constantly going and trying to fix. Second observation, we have got a social media now that is very different than it was 50 years ago. And if you're looking for ways in which individuals can make a difference, I think we have a tool through social media that can spread the word about things that are good and things that are not you know, look at the incident on, on United Airlines the other day, 
Okay, that has gone everywhere. You don't think that the airlines are going to, all airlines, certainly United, but all airlines are going to be much more sensitive to the fact that they now exist in a world in which there are cameras constantly in people's hands that are, can, can video er everything, and they're going to be much more responsive to the desires of passengers. Well, if you take that principle that we're much more interconnected now than we were, then there's much greater opportunity for individuals on an individual basis to make change in what might be considered small and simple ways, but I'm convinced there are no small and simple things, and that in fact, in large numbers, we can have a big make a big difference. Now, Thanks that is a good that is a good line to <laughs> to end a panel with. So what I what I'd like to do, I'm going to ask give everybody one minute of a closing remark. But I want to I want to at least invite people. You'll do whatever you want to do. I know that. But I want to invite you, and I want to invite everybody in the audience to take the one minute to think. Okay. Given all this stuff, what am I doing now, or what am I about to be doing? Um, that is my way of trying to make that difference. And I'm going to ask it across uh, this group for what you're doing here. I'll say at the Kennedy School, because I want to bring this down to, you know, are we part of the problem, or do, can we do some things here that are useful? <clears throat> and I want to end uh, going back to Andreas here uh, as, uh, from a student perspective here. So a minute each. But a minute each for you guys as well. Write it down in your little <coughs> notebook. Um, what am I doing in my current institution, the Kennedy School, your current institutions, um, to address these issues? Rob, you start. I'll finish with you this time. Okay. So um, the, uh, there are a number of people in the room who took my environmental economics class sometime during the last 27 years. And there are a number of people in the room who are taking it right now. And something that I was very proud of uh, was that when someone finished taking that 26 course, 26 class course, at the end of it, they couldn't tell if I was a tree-hugging environmentalist from the left or an industry apologist from the right. But we told them. <laughs> but, because my purpose was to give them the analytical tools such that they could assess the problems they face using their own values, not my values. I was able to continue to do that until October of this, of this past year. And I felt that I just no longer could. And I, I find it extremely sad. And so my hope going forward is that Roger is right and that a year from now I'll be able to return to that situation and present the material without anyone having a clue of what my views are, of what's taking place specifically in our political world. But if Roger's not right, then I'll hope that I can do that three and a half years from now instead. <laughs> the good news is that in the face of this at Harvard, at the Harvard Kennedy School in particular, uh, we continue to do research that's path breaking. And importantly, something about the Kennedy School is that it's not just research, it's research that's tied in with engagement with the real world, with private industry, with government, and with advocacy groups. And as Bill Clark knows well, I've been running something, and some of you have been engaged in it, the Harvard Project on Climate Agreements for 10 years, doing just that. And we're continuing that work. Uh, we were go to the negotiations regularly. <coughs> we had some successes in the recent negotiations, and we're hoping there'll be more going forward. And in the short term, what we're doing in the US is working with the states, is working that list of states I mentioned before, in order to make sure that under the Paris Climate Agreement, if necessary, their actions become recognized so that countries like India and Brazil, where there's a lot of internal political opposition to the targets that they've adopted, don't, aren't able to point to the United States and say it's doing nothing. So that people around the world will, if necessary, recognize the United States as defined geographically, not defined by the federal government. Thank you. Um, Roger, you're not a quants guy, so uh, you don't get to interpret one minute uh, as fluidly as Rob did. So, uh. <laughs> okay, I will, I will try to keep it within 60 seconds. I, I think the great uh, hope for the future as a result of being here at the Kennedy School is twofold. One is the students who continue to come, and they're really bright, and they're really capable, and they learn a lot, 
and they stay committed to public service when they leave. Secondly, the Kennedy School, as evidenced by today, but this is not an unusual day, it happens every week, has great convening power. It can bring people together from all across the country to discuss important problems. And as long as the Kennedy School stays as a beacon where it attracts great students, uh, good faculty, and a, a remarkable uh, capacity to convene and get people to come together to discuss issues like we have been discussing today, then I think you know we're gonna we're gonna continue to muddle through. That's just the nature of uh, of our society. I actually happen to think it's it's a good feature, but it needs places like the Kennedy School to make it work. Gina. Well, I'm going to be very brief. Uh, I don't have an institution because I'm out of a job, <laughs> so <laughs> I don't time. have to. I don't yeah. have to take <laughs> responsibility that for that. Um, <laughs> no, I just uh, really my answer was was very close to. Um, Rogers, and, and that is that, you know, I, I, I'm i going to maintain a very hopeful position because I really think the, the, the students that I have met are really quite remarkable. Um, they provide a, a vision for the future that I think is, is a good one and will help us continue with our muddling. Um, I agree we muddle all the time. It just depends on what direction we're heading. Uh, so let's keep hoping we're heading in the right direction. That's it. Um, so I'm supposed to do this too, they told me. Um, uh, yes, students, that's why I'm here instead of at the Brookings Institution or some national laboratory. Uh, this particular year when I was uh, supposed to be on sabbatical, however, my thing of doing things for Harvard has been uh, uh, saying yes to a president of a, of a $4 billion a year turnover company that happens to be Harvard University uh, to uh, co-chair her group on saying, okay, we just over the last 10 years committed to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 30% on a, on a long-term trajectory towards zero. What do we do for the next 10 years and 50 years going out? Uh, how should this university be complementing uh, its, its talk in the classroom and the research laboratories and so on uh, with what we actually do in that space? And it's been, uh, it's been a marvelous committee of students, uh, staff, uh, faculty, career researchers, and so on, and looking at how that cross-section can come together and actually cross uh, what I think President Faust will be announcing in, in due course uh, through climate weeks and beyond is a, is a very adventurous scheme to have Harvard uh, walking its talk. So that's, that's been my, my how you spent your summer vacation. <laughs> Finish this up, Andreas. Briefly, well, of as, course. As the resident millennial up here, I can say <laughs> that um, the day I turned in my thesis, I received an email from Opower uh, informing me that I was 30% less energy efficient than my neighbors. But on a more serious note, I'm actually very um, encouraged by my fellow students here. I think that what the Kennedy School is striving to teach students is to be what I think Joe Nye has coined tri-sector athletes, people that can work across the public, private, and nonprofit sectors. And so I'm, I'm encouraged by the work that my fellow students are doing. And I have friends who are in a climate justice uh, caucus, and they are planning ways to become more, uh, more activist in, in upcoming years. And so. Several of them will be marching um, next weekend um, in the climate march, and I'm, so I'm very encouraged by that, uh, by that progress, and also this, I think, a renewed sense of activism among my fellow students. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So on behalf of the panel, let me thank you all for being here, uh, doing what I know many of you do in the cause of environment, human health, and well-being. Uh, uh, wish you on your way for the uh, remainders of this uh, uh, centennial of, of John Kennedy and the vision uh, that he provided for so many of us uh, of uh, there's, uh, there's worth and value and a good life to be, uh, to be made uh, in trying to advance uh, the human condition. So here we are. Thank you for coming.